So this week, I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, we have two speakers. So there's a double act here. Uh, Troy Shinbrot is a faculty member in bioengineering at Rutgers University. And we were just discussing in, in the other Brunswick. And uh, Jonah Botvinnik Greenhouse is a graduate student at Cornell who was an undergrad working with Troy. Uh, they studied um, the dynamics of juggling and they wrote a paper for Physics Today, which lots of, caused lots of people to discuss uh, the science of juggling. Uh, so I thought it would be good to get them to talk to us. And I asked Troy to speak and he said, well, I, I really need Jonah because we need demos if we're going to do this talk. So, so fortunately, Jonah agreed to do it as well. So, so we're going to hear all about the dynamics of juggling. So uh, you can share your screen now. It's all yours. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sharing my screen. Um, everyone can see this okay? Yeah, it looks yeah, good. Okay, awesome. Um, and if you have questions throughout, just feel free to interrupt or put something in the chat and I'll do my best to respond to it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be talking to you today about the dynamics of juggling. Um, yeah, this is based on some work I did with Professor Shinbrot a couple years ago, and I'm really excited to be able to share it with you today. So I want to begin by talking a bit about control and juggling. And really, there are two main types of control that the juggler could exercise. We have open loop and closed loop control. So in open loop control systems, the juggler um, is restricted to wearing a blindfold while they perform the patterns. Um, so what we're watching right here is a quick video of the current world record for five ball blindfolded juggling. And as you can see, it doesn't last very long uh, because juggling with the blindfold is very difficult. Uh, here, the juggler is required to establish a consistent rhythm with their arms, wrists, and hands and just hope everything falls into place. However, as you might expect, when the blindfold comes off, juggling becomes a lot easier. Uh, what we're watching here on the right is the current world record for juggling nine balls. And you can see that when visual feedback is available, the juggler is actually able to move around and save bad catches. Uh, they're no longer stationary in one place. And so while it is intuitive that juggling should be easier when you can look at the balls with your eyes, it's not actually obvious exactly what control mechanisms allow for this. Um, and so an initial guess could be, uh, are the jugglers possibly reacting to every single throw individually? Um, so we can test this by looking at a quick distribution of human reaction times. Uh, we see that this distribution has a mean of about 250 milliseconds, uh, but that the time between catches from the last video we just watched of the nine ball world record, since at about 180 milliseconds, and in fact, jugglers are able to perform patterns that go below or near uh, 100 milliseconds. And so it's highly unlikely that jugglers are actually able to react to each individual throw. Rather, uh, jugglers exercise some form of dynamical prediction to be able to extend their reaction times. So if you watch a juggler perform, um, and throughout, I'm gonna be juggling a little bit uh, to give you guys some quick demonstrations. Um, so maybe you could have uh, my video in the corner. Uh, if Jugglers, when they perform, they don't actually have to look at their hands. They look up at the peaks of their patterns. Um, so I'm not looking at my, my hands as they catch the balls. And the reason jugglers look up towards the peak of their pattern uh, is because that's where the velocity of the balls is zero. And so the information is almost clustering there. It's where you can get the most uh, kind of information per unit time when you're looking. Uh, so it's a really efficient way uh, to get gauge uh, the shape of the pattern by looking at the peak. And a study in the early 2000s showed that both human and monkey brains are capable of computing internal representations of equations of motion um, in their brain. And so by looking at those peaks, uh, the jugglers are possibly able to predict these parabolic trajectories and move their hands to where they need to be to catch these objects. Um, another factor at play is muscle memory, which is really well known, but not uh, understood too well. And so uh, another study in the early 2000s uh, showed that by prolonging the duration of stimulation, um, in locations uh, of chimpanzee brains, um, they're able to recall complex coordinated motions. And so just as the chimpanzee may raise two hands to take a bite of food, uh, a juggler is able to recall the sequence of motions required to perform like five ball or nine ball juggling. So these are some factors at play um, for how jugglers are able to sustain these uh, seemingly impossible patterns. Although it's not totally clear in what way they interact to make these uh, feats possible. One interesting lens uh, which you could study the physiology of juggling through is uh, juggling robots. And again, these can be open loop or closed loop. So here on the left, we have an open loop system. Uh, this robot was built by Claude Shannon and it's bounced juggling five objects. Um, I wanna mention that it's easier to build a juggling robot 
uh, that bound struggles because now the catches are made um, when the velocity of the object is near zero at the, the peaks rather um, than in regular toss struggling, where when the object is coming down, the magnitude of its velocity is the greatest. Um, however, it is possible to build a juggling robot that is closed loop and performs five objects um, in a regular toss struggling fashion. Um, but now the, the balls have to be tracked by a camera at some frame rate. And in this case, the, the rate is 60 Hertz. And now the human eye is able to track objects at five Hertz and perform much more difficult patterns. And so kind of unraveling uh, what is behind the physiology of human juggling could help build more dexterous robots. And it's an interesting perspective to approach the problem of dexterity and robots from. And so now uh, the goal of the talk moving forward is gonna be uh, to make baby steps towards that type of analysis of, of what is going on when a human juggles, what makes a pattern easy, what makes a pattern hard, how can we gauge the stability of these patterns? So we need to take a step back and actually quantify what is juggling. Uh, and so to do this, I'm gonna introduce some mathematics of juggling known as site swap and explain to you the basics of what creates a juggling pattern. So juggling, a very loose definition is, it is the continuous throwing and catching of more objects than hands being used. And so here's a quick graphic of what's known as a three ball cascade. And it looks like this. Um, you can probably hear the balls hitting my hands, uh, and it's not a coincidence that they're happening on regular beats. And so we're going to assume for any juggling pattern that throws are occurring on regular beats and that the rhythm is left, right, left, right, left, right. And so there's two main types of juggling patterns that one could perform, uh, namely cascades and fountains. So odd numbers of objects are always going to be juggled in cascades. Um, a cascade is crossing left, right, left, right. Um, so my left hand is always thrown to the right hand and the right hand is always thrown to the left hand. This is a quick graphic of a five ball cascade and it looks like this. And this might seem a bit surprising, but even numbers of objects are juggled in fountains, which are non-crossing. Uh, there's no way to juggle four balls in a crossing way uh, that satisfies all the assumptions of the juggling pattern we've stated so far. That the, the throws occur right, left, right, left, right, left. They all go to the same height. Uh, the objects in a four ball fountain cannot cross. So they're going to stay on either, either side of my body. And so those are the two main types of juggling patterns uh, for juggling either even or odd numbers of objects. Uh, so what can be really helpful uh, when analyzing a juggling pattern is counting the number of beats um, until an object is manipulated again. That is, when a ball is in the air, how many beats pass before that ball is thrown? Um, because we're going to use those numbers to then mathematically define um, various types of juggling patterns so we can stray away from the simple cascades and fountains um, and create more complex patterns. For instance, we could um, build a pattern where four balls pop, but then we would have to destroy the effect of all the objects that run up to the same height. So in this case, we're going to count the number of beats, um, how often the red ball is thrown. So once it's thrown, I'm going to start counting. Um, we're going to wait for it to get to my hand again, and then we're going to count one, two, three, four, and then it's thrown again. And so this is a quick video of a four ball fountain, and it's not a coincidence that every ball in a four ball fountain is thrown every four beats. Similarly, we can do the same thing for the five ball cascade, and we better hope that every ball is thrown every five beats. So let's count again how often the red ball is thrown. I'll start counting once it reaches my right hand. We have one, two, three, four, five throw. So in the four ball fountain, every ball is thrown every four beats. And in the five ball cascade, every ball is thrown every five beats. And those numbers are obviously not a coincidence. And so we're going to start using the number of beats uh, between throws to define um, various juggling patterns. Um, so it, it may have felt unintuitive that four balls, when I said this, this is the standard four ball pattern, they don't cross. To a lot of people, this feels unsatisfying. Um, they might want to see four balls cross because there, there's something about the way our brains work where juggling feels like it should cross from side to side. So both hands are truly involved. Um, and there is a way to make four balls cross. But as I said before, you have to destroy the symmetry. The throws can't all be to the same height. So here's a quick video uh, of what it looks like when four balls is crossing. But now one hand has to throw higher than the other. And so if you don't like the slow motion, um, I can do this for you here. You can see my right hand is throwing a little bit higher than my left hand. And they're able to cross, uh, but the symmetry of the heights is, is now gone. And so now what we're going to do um, to be able to mathematically define this pattern 
um, is count the number of beats uh, between throws for these high throws and these low throws. So we can ask the same questions. How often is this red ball thrown? And we're going to ask this question based on the throws from the right hand that are high and the throws from the left hand that are low. So first, let's look at the throws from the right hand. So the, uh, the red ball's leaving my right hand now. Let's throw every one, two, three, four, five, and then it's thrown again. Uh, so from the right hand, all the high throws are manipulated every five beats. Uh, we can similarly do the same thing for throws from the left hand. And so the red ball is approaching the left hand now, and we're going to start counting. It's thrown every one, two, three, and then it's thrown again. And so from the left hand, it's thrown every three beats. Um, so before we had that every object in the four ball fountain was thrown every four beats. Now we have that objects from the right hand are thrown every, manipulated again every five beats, and from the left hand, they're manipulated again every three beats. And so that's breaking down the symmetry of the heights uh, that I just discussed. Um, and it's precisely why we've been counting the beats, because it's a lot easier to say, in the case of this last four ball pattern, um, what does it mean to juggle four balls anymore? There's a bunch of ways you could do it. They could be thrown every four beats or every five and then three. And now we can actually call this pattern just five, three, because you throw fives from the right hand and threes from the left hand and that repeats. So this is five, three, and this is four. And this gets at uh, what is known as site swap notation. Um, and it, it's literally just listing out uh, the number of beats until each object, object is manipulated again after being thrown uh, in a sequence. So for the four balls on the left, it's site swap four. The five balls is site swap five. And then what we just talked about was site swap five, three. And so when we're looking at these, uh, we have to watch videos of the juggling to understand what's going on. Uh, but there's a way to compress all this information into the 2D plane. Um, and that's what's known as a ladder diagram. And so we're going to talk about a different way of uh, visually representing these juggling patterns now, which is helpful for understanding what's going on. OK, so we're going to have two axes. Um, one is going to be hand position, and the other is going to be time. And we're going to this is good we're going to denote um, by these closed black circles, balls that are thrown, and by the open circles, balls that are caught. And so in time, um, we're going to have throws and catches, obviously. Uh, and so the top rung of the ladder is going to be my left hand, and the bottom rung is going to be my right hand. Um, we're going to denote balls that are in the hand uh, by this dotted blue line. And after a ball is caught, it's going to have to be thrown again at some point. So we're going to connect all of the times when a ball is caught uh, to the location and time from that hand uh, after which it's thrown. And so before these connections, all of these are just saying that the ball is caught and it stays in the hand until it's thrown. And then this is where the magic of the ladder diagram happens. We're going to denote the balls in the air uh, by a solid red line. And so what we can do is connect the locations where balls are thrown uh, to locations where they're caught to define uh, various juggling patterns on these ladder diagrams. And one such way we can do this uh, looks like the following. So there's some juggling pattern that this ladder diagram is telling us to visualize. Um, and we can get at what it, the ladder diagram is saying this is uh, just by counting the number of beats as we were earlier. And so we, we can perform the exact same exercise. Now there's not a red ball that we're tracking, but we can find one of these lines and count the number of beats um, until it's thrown again. So let's look at this line. And it's thrown every, here it's thrown on this beat. So this is one two, three beats, and then it's thrown again, right? So its periodicity is three. It's being thrown every three beats. And if we look at every line, it's actually symmetrical in that sense. Every object in this pattern is thrown every three beats. And so from what we've discussed, that means that its site swap is three, 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 or just the three ball cascade. So this is what that ladder diagram is telling us. It's precisely the struggling pattern. This is the most basic struggling pattern. Um, and there's a few general rules of site swaps that are interesting to talk about. Um, so if you have a string of numbers that is a site swap, it defines a juggling pattern. You can put it on a ladder diagram. You can take the average of those digits, and that's precisely the number of balls which are being juggled. Uh, moreover, if you have a ladder diagram, you can take a vertical line through the diagram, and the number of intersections it has um, with horizontal or slanted lines is the number of balls that you're juggling. This is analogous to just watching a video of someone juggling, pausing the video, and then counting all the balls in the frame. Uh, because remember, this vertical line through the ladder diagram is a slice through time. 
So it's almost like you're stopping time and saying, how many balls are there in this diagram? And so one example uh, where we can build some intuition for this is the site swap 615. So if we average the digits of 615, we get four. This is what the ladder diagram looked like for 615. Uh, this obviously looks very different um, from the ladder diagram we have for the standard three ball cascade um, because we have these sixes which are coming back to the same hands and these ones which are zips across essentially. And so these ladder diagrams can start to look really crazy once you get to complicated sites. Um, but it's a really good way of compressing information into the 2D plane of that drumline pattern. Um, so let's take a vertical slice and sure enough, we get four intersections. Um, so at least these two methods agree with each other. And indeed, if I juggle the 615 pattern for you, it's gonna look like this. Um, and I'm now doing it with four balls, just like we predicted. But you can look and you can see that on the sides are the sixes. There's a five going up the middle between the sixes. And then every three beats, I'm just zipping one ball across from one hand to the other, uh, which is precisely what that one defines. Okay. Moving on. Uh, you might now ask, could I just give you a random sequence of numbers and could you juggle that for me? Would that necessarily be a site swap? Um, and that would be a good question, uh, but unfortunately the answer is no. Site swaps have to satisfy some additional properties. Um, and so if you want to see if a sequence of numbers is a site swap or you're trying to construct a new juggling trick, you think it would be really cool um, to have throws aligning in this order of heights or something like that, to check if it's a site swap, you need to look at the uniqueness of the following terms. And looking at the uniqueness of these terms is essentially the same as building a ladder diagram and mapping all of these beats um, to their respective hands that they're caught by and making sure that multiple balls are not arriving in one hand at the same time. And so we can play this game now where we look at a few strings of numbers and try and guess which one is actually the site swap. So if we start with five, four, and three, we're now working mod three, right? Because all of these are site swaps of period. We see that five plus zero mod three is two and four plus one mod three is two as well. So these first two throws, um, we already have see this uniqueness breaking down, right? Five plus zero equals four plus one mod three. And that means that the first two throws are going to be caught in the same hand at the same time, which for our type of site swap is no good. It means we're getting something like this, where I make a five and a four at once, and then I'm supposed to catch them both at the same time in one hand. Um, this is known by jugglers as a squeeze catch, and it, it's generally pretty difficult to do in a normal juggling pattern. And so for our definitions of site swaps, uh, we want to avoid those. There are more complicated uh, ways of defining site swap that allow for things like that. Uh, but for our purposes, we don't want things like this happening because it makes the juggling really difficult. Five, three, four, on the other hand, um, you can actually see that all these terms are unique and you get a four ball pattern that looks like this. You can see the high five, then the three going underneath it and the four shooting up on the side afterwards. And the last site swap, 513, um, is really just 543 in disguise because four and one are the same mod three. And so this can't be a site swap either. Um, so in fact, when you see a list of numbers and you're asking if you can juggle it, you should be rather skeptical and because you really need to check this condition first. Um, so now that we've had some practice and we've gotten uh, a little acclimated to talking about site swaps and ladder diagrams, um, I want to play a quick game with you guys and see if you can match uh, what's happening in the juggling pattern to the appropriate ladder diagram. Uh, so here is a four ball fountain. Uh, it looks like this, not in slow motion. Which uh, letter do you guys think this diagram? Um, or which diagram do you think describes this juggling pattern? You want to put it in the chat? Yeah, so I can see some people saying C. Yeah, a lot of Cs, and that's correct. Uh, that's the only one where the throws are not crossing, right? Um, they're staying on their respective sides. And we can see actually, if we count the number of beats, balls are thrown every four beats in this. And so it's precisely the four ball fountain. Okay, what about this one? Which ladder diagram are we looking at now? Can you see the video playing? I'll give you guys a second. Yeah, yeah, I see some people saying B. Um, B is correct. Um, and so 
We could figure this out by counting the number of beats after which objects are thrown again in B, or we could just look at the kind of the geometry of the ladder diagram. We see that throws from one hand uh, for B, they take a long time to reach the catch locations. Here we have these long throws, and then on the other hand, from the left hand, the throws um, have a shorter uh, time of travel before they're caught again. And so here we have this asymmetrical 5 3 pattern with four balls. And so the right hand is making those high throws that take five beats to land, and the left hand is making those low throws that take three beats to land. And lastly, um, this top ladder diagram describes the five ball cascade. Yeah, so that's um, a quick introduction uh, to ladder diagrams. Um, we can also, here's one more thing, uh, look at, at a ladder diagram and figure out exactly what site swap is represented. And so to do this, um, we look at the number of distinct types of throws that are occurring. Um, in this case, we see that there's this um, kind of periodic behavior in the ladder diagram where every three beats, we have this intersection of three different types of throws. Uh, so we know that three different types of throws are occurring. And then we need to count the beats uh, before each of these different throws lands. So we have one long throw that takes five beats to land, one, two, three, four, five. We have one medium throw that takes one, two, three beats to land. And we have one zip across, that's just one beat. And so just from that information, we have five, three, and one repeating. The side swap is five, three, one, and it's a three ball pattern that looks like this. You can see there's the high five, three going back and forth in the middle, and then I'm zipping this one across from hand to hand. Side swap is a notation for specifying uh, what type of pattern is performed. And so each digit in a side swap says, I throw this ball, how many beats later is it thrown again? You can roughly think about it. This isn't technically correct, but for intuition, you can think about it as the relative heights of the throws. So in a five, three, one, I have a five throw, a three throw, and a one throw. The five is high, the three is low, and the one is middle. So each digit specifies the type of throw I'm making at that beat. Does that make sense? A little bit. So five, three, one is high, middle, low. Five, three, four is high, low, middle, kind of like this. And then site swap the Odd numbers cross, the even numbers don't cross. Um, yes. That's the quick and formal version of what site swap is. But really, each throw, each digit in a site swap specifies the number of beats in the pattern before that object is thrown again. So now we're going to talk about how we can compare the difficulty uh, of various site swaps. Uh, you can define a bunch of different site swaps, uh, but you want to know which ones are harder, uh, which should be more impressive to perform, things like that. And so the way we're going to do this is construct a, a simulation of juggling. It's going to be open loop. We're going to have hands oscillating at a constant frequency, and balls are going to be thrown and caught in prescribed locations. And as we change the type of pattern, the, the variables that we need to be really mindful of um, are the hand frequency, throw velocity, and throw angle. These are all going to be changing as we change the type of pattern. And so we'll start out by simulating the hands. Um, they can be defined by these equations, which just describe uh, anti-symmetric oscillating ellipses. This is what the hands look like in the simulation. And when I juggle myself, the hands look something like this. And so if we simulate an odd number of objects, first we're going to start with cascades and fountains, just as we did when we were talking about site swap theory, and then we can get more complicated. Um, that's the same as juggling 2n plus 1 balls, where n is a positive integer. We can derive um, the throw velocities uh, as follows. So in these equations, g is gravity, and f is the hand frequency. And so these equations make sense because as you increase the number of balls, uh, the throw velocity is going to have to get greater. But you can reduce uh, the throw velocity or the height of your pattern by moving your hands faster. So there's this trade-off between number of objects juggled and hand frequency. You can increase the height with the number of objects, but you can reduce the height by moving your hands faster. And this is a quick video of what it looks like when our simulation juggles an odd number of objects. Here it is performing the seven ball cascade for you. And uh, you should know exactly where the catches are made because soon this is going to be changing um, right in the corner of this axis precisely every time. We're soon going to be adding noise to these simulations and you're going to see this location change. Uh, but this is what it looks like when it juggles without noise. Similarly, we can simulate an even number of objects, uh, which is juggling two end balls. Uh, and the equations, they look similar, but there's this funny looking n minus one half uh, in the numerator of our our 
vertical velocity and it, it's also lurking in the denominator of our horizontal velocity. And the reason we have this difference of one half <clears throat> is because when we juggle an odd number of objects, when we make a throw, the hand that has to catch that object is currently making a catch and it has to oscillate all the way around before it can make another catch. However, when we juggle an even number of objects right after we make a throw, the hand that's going to be catching that object, remember it's an even number of objects and the objects don't cross down, the hand that's going to be catching that object was the one that just made that throw. So before it makes the next catch, it only has to oscillate halfway around. And that's exactly where this difference of one half is coming from, these equations for the velocities. And here's a quick video of what it looks like when our simulation juggles an even number of objects. This is it performing six balls. So we still have to specify the height that the simulation is juggling at. Um, we can write the hand frequency as a function of the height. And so uh, we were defining our equations for velocity in terms of hand frequency. So if we know the height, we can use this to specify the hand frequency. And the way that we set the height is by following uh, standard pattern heights that were used to set various juggling world records. And this in some sense optimizes the height um, that the simulation juggles at for human purposes, uh, because these were all set um, as world records, these are in some sense optimized pattern heights. And so now we're in a good situation to be able to compare the difficulty of patterns now that we have a simulation. The way we can do this is just by adding noise and seeing when we observe failures in one pattern over another. And so our first question is gonna be, which of these two patterns is easier, the five ball cascade or the five ball shower? Um, you guys wanna put in the chat, which one you think is gonna be easier or which one is going to be able to withstand more noise. And I'll show you quickly on the video. This is what a, a cascade looks like for three balls. This is the standard pattern which we've been discussing and this is what the shower looks like. So in the shower, one hand does all the work and the other's just shuffling across whereas in the cascade, Some people are saying shower, some are saying cascade. Um, so yeah, let's find out. We're gonna run the simulation, we're gonna add noise, uh, and we're gonna figure out which one of these patterns is easier. Okay, so let's see. And again, these can both be designed, uh, defined with site swap notation like we discussed earlier. Uh, the five ball cascade is site swap five, and the five ball shower is site swap nine one. The nine for the high throws and the one for all the shuffles across. The three ball cascade is site swap five one. My left hand is doing the ones with shuffle across, and the right hand is throwing these fives with the left hand. Okay. Moving on. Um, right, we're going to analyze the stability by adding noise to the throws. So here on the left is the simulation running without noise. And then on the right, we're going to be adding perturbations uh, to the throw angles and velocities. And so you can see now. Uh, before I told you to take note of exactly where the simulation was making its catches. Now we can see that the catches are no longer made in these optimal locations. The hand has to suck the balls in um, when they're close enough, but not necessarily optimal. And eventually when the, the radius is so far from the hand that it can't make the catch, the simulation stops and says that there was a juggling failure. And so first we're gonna analyze uh, the stability of the, the shower and the cascade when both kind of are juggled to exactly the same height. So here is what uh, the simulation looks like when both the, the shower and cascade are juggled to the same height. You can see there's this 1.4 on the y-axis. Um, and it's important to note that the types of throws we see on the left for the cascade and the types of throws we see on the right for the shower, they're exactly the same type of parabolic trajectory. Uh, identical types of throws, the only difference is in the cascade, um, the balls get to traverse twice the distance um, when compared to the shower because both hands are making that whereas in the shower, only one hand is making the throw and the other is zipping it across. This means that hands are going to have to move about twice as fast when the shower pattern is performed. Um, and you can really see that when you just look at the, the speed of the hands in the simulation. They're moving much more quickly in the shower on the right than they are in the cascade on the left. So because of these factors, any differences we observe in the stabilities um, of these two patterns can be largely attributed to errors in catch timing rather than catch location. Uh, I'll say that again because it's important. When we observe differences in the success or failure of the cascade and shower, it's going to be because of differences in catch timing rather than location because the throws are the same, but the catch timing is different because the shower hands have to move faster. And so this is how we analyze the stability. 
And before I put the stability plot for the shower up, I'll just explain what we're looking at here for the cascade. On the x-axis, we're looking at angle deviation. And on the y-axis, we have speed deviation. And these are the Gaussian deviations that we've applied to each throw angle and velocity uh, that reset after each throw of the simulation. So say we, we pick some angle deviation, some speed deviation, say we land here. Uh, we're going to run the simulation 10 times and see if it's able to successfully complete 50 catches of juggling. And if it is, um, we attribute that a juggling success. And so we do that process 10 times in a row, and then we shade it based on some color uh, for the proportion of those trials, um, which resulted in juggling success. So here is the combination of noise uh, that always results in a juggling success for the five ball cascade. And out here, our juggling um, simulation is always destined to fail, essentially. And this is some gray zone where sometimes, depending on the noise, how lucky we get, it's going to succeed and sometimes it's going to fail. So this is what it looks like for the cascade. And so we can compare its success, its relative difficulty with the shower performed at the same height if we do the same plot for the shower. And so we see that the five ball shower is able to tolerate less speed deviation than the cascade. However, they're able to tolerate the same amount of angle deviation. So we said that any differences we observe in these stability plots, we can largely attribute to differences in catch timing. And so this serves as a first indication um, that speed deviation is really um, a primary control over catch timing errors rather than angle deviation. So we can prove this for ourselves further by looking at a quick sensitivity analysis uh, of noise as it applies to catch timing. So the time of catch uh, for a parabolic throw uh, with initial speed v and angle theta is given by this equation in blue. And we can create a contour plot of this. Um, on top of these contours, we have a scatter plot of the relevant uh, throw velocity and angle combinations that are standard uh, for juggling patterns. And so when we ask how noise affects catch timing, we can imagine applying some perturbation to the throw angle or velocity for a given number of objects and seeing how much the catch timing changes. So say we're, we're juggling five balls and we want to know how much throw velocity or throw angle errors could affect um, an error in catch timing. If we have an error in throw angle, it's going to move us either up or down on this contour and the catch time stays uh, relatively constant. However, if we have errors in throw velocity, we're going to be moving perpendicular to the contours and the catch timing is going to change a lot. And so this really means that errors in throw velocity um, contribute highly to mistakes in catch timing but that errors in throw angle do not. Um, so we can go a step further and write down uh, an equation that says, if you have a perturbation delta V to your initial throw velocity, how does the catch timing change? Um, and this is gonna come in handy in a second because we see that um, this equation is largely independent of the throw height. Uh, we have this sine theta term uh, and theta is going to change as we throw higher, but the range of thetas uh, for which juggling occurs during um, it's, it's so close to pi over two that we can almost assume that the throws are vertical. So we're gonna get around 5% differences for these errors in catch timing for the same uh, perturbation to the initial throw velocity. What this means is if I'm juggling nine balls very high, um, the same error in throw velocity will um, accumulate to the same, sorry, if I'm juggling nine balls very high, an error in the initial throw velocity uh, will result in the same error in catch timing as if I was juggling five balls at a medium height. So these errors in catch time are largely independent of the throw height for the patterns. We can then ask the same question for how noise affects the catch location. Um, and the, the equation for the catch location is defined as follows. We have this v squared sine two theta over g, and we can again make a contour plot of the catch location as a function of throw angle and throw velocity. Again, we've placed a scatter plot um, of the relevant combinations of throw velocity and throw angle for three through 11 balls. Uh, but now the situation is a little bit less clear um, because before we had that we would move, um, if we moved throw velocity or throw angle, one was parallel to the contours and one was perpendicular to the contours. Uh, however, now uh, it seems like to change the catch location the most, say we were juggling five balls, we wanted to see a large change in catch location to move perpendicular to these contours, we have to change both the throw angle and the throw velocity. And so um, the roles of throw angle and throw velocity in determining errors in catch location are not initially very clear for the purposes of our simulations. So now we wanna ask, does angle or velocity noise affect errors in catch location more heavily? 
To do this, we're going to look at a stability analysis um, of the cascade burst of shower again, um, this time with equal hand frequencies. So before, when we were looking at the cascade versus the shower, um, the heights were the same, but the hand frequencies were different. Remember, the, the shower was going twice as fast as the cascade. Um, now the hand frequencies are the same, but the shower is throwing much higher than the cascade if you look at frequencies on these plots. So because the hand frequencies are the same, um, the errors in catch timing between these two simulations will be exactly the same, but because the throws are no longer identically parabolic, um, these throws go much higher than these, um, we're going to see that one simulation may be able to suffer more errors in catch location than the other. So any differences we see in the stability plots of the cascade and shower when the hand frequencies are the same, we can attribute to errors made in the catch location. Um, and so by seeing whether the angle or velocity noise is causing these errors, we're going to be able to determine um, what influences the catch location the most. So here's the stability plot for the five ball cascade, and here it is for the shower. And so remarkably, we see that the velocity deviation is constant for both. This goes back to uh, when I was saying that the uh, uh, catch timing errors from the velocity throws, um, sorry, the catch timing errors from errors in the initial velocity uh, can only change by about 5%, uh, depending on how high you throw it. Um, and so here, yeah, we, we see that the cascade can tolerate much more angle deviation than the shower. And this implies um, that errors in the angle are really what control errors in the catch location is the main takeaway from these plots. We can again uh, conduct a sensitivity analysis of these errors in catch location. And we see that it depends on this V squared term when there's a perturbation delta theta applied to the throw angle. This means that the higher you throw, um, the worse uh, some error in the initial throw angle is going to, to propagate. Um, and we can get some more intuition for this equation um, by looking at the, the realm of thetas in which juggling occurs. Um, this cosine two theta term is always going to be negative for juggling patterns. And so what this is saying is if you um, apply some positive delta theta perturbation to your throw angle, you're actually going to end up throwing too shallow. Your throw is not going to go far enough. But if you um, bring the th angle theta down a little bit closer to the 45 degree angle, you're going to over. So this was for the cascade versus the shower, but we can carry out this type of analysis uh, for several more site swaps. Um, and so when we're simulating these site swaps, every single digit in the site swap di is just a standard ball, uh, standard throw in a pattern of di objects. So here's what it looks like when we simulate the 753 pattern and the 933 pattern. So I'm juggling next to the simulation so you can see what the pattern looks like in real life. And on the right is what it looks like when we simulate it. So we can conduct this stability analysis for these site swaps. Um, and they're all simulated with exactly the same hand frequency, which is why we see that they're all able to tolerate the same amount of speed deviation. Remember that we said that errors in the throw velocity primarily control errors in catch timing. Uh, well, here they're all able to tolerate exactly the same amount of speed deviation, which makes perfect sense given that hypothesis, uh, because the hand frequencies, they're all the same. So they should all be able to tolerate the same errors in catch timing. Um, we do see that the 933 can tolerate the least amount of angle deviation, the 753 in the middle, and the 5 uh, the most angle deviation. And this is because we said angle deviation primarily controls errors in catch location. And these propagate uh, more and more and more the higher you throw. And so because we have this 9 in the 933, the 7 in the 753, these rather high throws, these patterns are able to tolerate um, less angle deviation. And so all of these examples we've looked at so far. Um, we're looking at the effects of noise um, while we keep either the hand frequency, um, it's while we keep either the hand frequency or the, the pattern height constant, right? So first we looked at the shower versus the cascade at a constant pattern height, and then we looked at the shower versus the cascade with a constant hand frequency and observed the differences. Now we want to know what happens when we allow both to vary. And when we do, we get these really interesting plots uh, where there seems to be this inverse relationship um, between the amount of angle deviation and speed deviation that you can tolerate as a function of height. Um, so what's happening here is we're just looking at a cascade. Um, for these simulations, it was a five ball cascade, but I'll show you with a three ball cascade here. Um, 
we're picking some height, and then we want to see how much angle deviation, speed deviation um, that height can tolerate. As we move higher, um, obviously the pattern height is changing and the hand frequency is changing. So by the time I'm at the highest, um, these patterns are going to go, my hand frequency is extremely slow. And that's part of what uh, contributes to this inverse phenomenon that we're about to explain. Um, so to understand this, remember that speed deviations primarily control errors in catch timing, whereas angle deviations primarily control errors in catch location. So when I'm juggling really high, the hand frequency is very low. So I have a lot of time in between my catches. So I'm allotted um, a wide margin of error for my speed deviations, which is why we see this large success region here. However, we saw that V squared term in front of the delta theta perturbation for the errors in catch location um, when there is some angle deviation. And that's why when you juggle really high, uh, you have to be really careful about your errors to the throw angles. And then as you move lower and lower down in the heights, the opposite becomes true. And that's exactly what accounts for this phenomenon that we're observing here. And so um, that more or less concludes uh, what I wanted to talk about today. We didn't answer the question, what is going on inside a juggler's brain when they're performing these, these tasks? Um, but we did take one baby step closer in that direction by talking about what makes a juggling pattern work, when does it succeed, when does it fail, and what factors contribute to those successes and failures. So just a quick summary, we spoke about the physiology of juggling, uh, talked a bit about juggling robots, um, we went over site soft notation and ladder diagrams, uh, how we can simulate the patterns and how we can use those pattern simulations to conduct sensitivity analyses to say when one pattern is easier or harder than another. In the future, this work can be extended in a few interesting ways. Uh, right now, the simulation is open loop, but obviously a closed loop simulation would be uh, more realistic to the human setting. Uh, and it could be an interesting way to gain some more insight into what's going on inside of juggler's brain. It would be interesting to study compounding Gaussian deviations for the throw angle and velocity noises. Uh, so when a juggler makes a mistake, typically uh, it's really hard to recover from it and mistakes propagate. And so maybe the next couple throws should be bad too in the simulation if one bad throw is made. Um, we could possibly make noise proportional to throw heights. Maybe it's more difficult to throw a nine than it is to throw a five. And so when you throw a nine, there's a larger chance uh, that the simulation incurs more velocity or angle errors. And um, all the, the juggling failures in these simulations were a result of drops due to missed hands, and we didn't consider collisions. However, um, accounting for collisions in the simulations could make it more difficult to achieve juggling successes and would make them more realistic. And all this is geared towards eventually understanding like, what is a juggling brain doing? But like I said, these are small baby steps and we're obviously not near doing that yet. But yeah, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and ask if there are any questions at this time. Great, thanks, Jonah. Um, let's make sure we bring in Troy. Um, I'm curious when you say simulations, if you mean like robots or in a computer, because I, I can make my computer juggle 300 balls if it wants to. Um, but I, I think humans are outperforming juggling robots right now. The most balls a human can juggle, it goes up to 11, 12, 13. But I haven't really seen a video of a robot toss juggling more than five balls successfully. There, there um, are juggling robots that can like roll balls on inclined platforms and they can juggle like seven balls. Um, but obviously you're reducing the effects of gravity um, and people can juggle more balls if they roll them on inclined planes as well. I'll just add that a really fun project for undergraduate students is to build juggling robots along the lines that Jonah mentioned, you know, on a, on a, on a tilted platform, the balls roll up and down and it's, it's not that difficult, but there are challenges to doing more than very simple juggling routines. So the ladder diagrams, they only specify the type of pattern you're doing, but they're not unique to the, the juggler's arm and hand movements. An interesting point that I didn't have time to cover is that there's a lot of different types of juggling patterns you can perform that have the same site swap. So this is site swap three, but this is also site swap three. So every ball is manipulated every three beats in this pattern. Um, 
but my, my hands are doing something weird. So site swap and ladder diagrams, it only tells you the order that the objects are manipulated, but it doesn't tell you anything about where the juggler's hands are when they're making the throws and catches. And so a nine ball ladder diagram, um, it would look very similar to this, except you would see um, each kind of diagonal uh, throw in the ladder. Um, this would then be caught over here or something like that. So the, the, the diagonals would just get longer. There would be more beats between each throw, but it would look very similar to this where you just have consistent crossing diagonals. Yeah, do you want I, to I respond are, to that? Yeah, yeah, the, they're all great ideas. I think our initial motivation was it's just really cool that jugglers are able to do these things that no one is able to explain why they're able to. I think that started as the motivation, and so understanding the physiology, um, I guess, yeah, some of the reasons you said it, it could link into things like music or physiotherapy, uh, but it really came from a place of it's very cool. How do humans do this? We want to learn more about what's going on behind the scenes. And from yeah. my point of view, as a non-juggler. I was really quite astonished that Jonah, who is an amazing juggler, he has lots of YouTubes that you might enjoy watching, <clears throat> cannot explain how, how, you know, how is it, what is going on in his own brain that allows him to do these things? It, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, so... I started juggling when I was 10 years old. Um, a lot of people who become professional jugglers or, or reach uh, a high level of proficiency, they usually start when they're, they're children. But I, I, I strongly believe that anybody can learn how to juggle um, at, at any age, I think. But getting up to like seven, eight, nine balls, um, it does take many hours of practice. And so, I mean, there were years where I would spend between like two and three hours a day practicing straight. Wow. Um, with like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, it was a huge part of my life. Can, there's a couple of other questions here, but just following on from that, d does it help you juggle to actually now have a mathematical framework or does it not have any impact? Um, it's a really interesting question. I'd say um, knowing about site swap theory, um, kind of the stuff I was talking about in the first half of the talk helps in the sense that it gives me more creative license with my juggling tricks. I'm better at saying this pattern is going to work so this ball can be here at this time. but the stuff I was talking about with stability analysis and when you throw higher, make sure you have tighter control over the angle, things like that. I find that it doesn't actually help to know that, um, that my brain just does what it does to keep the juggling pattern afloat. And yeah, that's the most I can ask of it. It's really hard to transfer the math into the juggling. So there's, um, Tricks you can do to create new site swaps. I didn't go over them, but it's like sometimes you can like raise one digit lower another than like take the average and it still works, stuff like that. Um, so this theory does help you find new patterns. I don't think we're anywhere near running out of juggling patterns uh, because site swaps, their period could be as long as you want. So there, there really are infinitely many patterns, but are there infinitely many interesting patterns or doable patterns is another question because obviously you don't want to site swap with period. Like once you get to like maybe five, six, seven, you're, you're not going to start seeing the, the shape of the pattern and it becomes a, a little less purposeful. Um, but the side swaps combined with arm movements, like am I catching one behind my head, stuff like that. Um, there's really a lot of opportunities, rich opportunities for different types of patterns. And there's ways, um, I didn't get into this much, but there's ways of extending the type of side swap notation that I went over um, to cover things like multiplexes here. You can throw two balls out of one hand at the same time. Uh, this is a five ball pattern. And there's site swap notation that accounts for these things called multiplexes and things like that, or the squeeze catches that we talked about. And so there's ways that you can look at a site swap and generate new site swaps from it mathematically. And you can look into things called state transition diagrams for juggling patterns, stuff like that. There's a lot out there about site swap theory that I didn't get to cover. Um, but the short answer is, I don't think we're anywhere near running out of patterns and there's lots of different ways you can generate them or come up with new ways of throwing and catching around your body. I think it has a lot to do with anticipation and looking at the pattern 
as one object rather than many at once. Um, if you watch, um, here, let me share my screen again so I can show you this video. Um, I wanna go back to the, the nine ball world record um, because sometimes it feels amazing when a juggler is able to make a save or move to correct a pattern. Uh, but I really think uh, that in most cases, it's by treating the pattern as a whole. You can see the body is moving around a lot when this pattern is performed, but it's not moving for any one specific ball. It's almost as if uh, when he has to make corrections, he's chasing the pattern as a whole. It's not one ball dictating his motion. He's not making individual saves. He, he's really controlling an entire pattern. And so I think it's about looking up at the peak um, and anticipating the locations that the balls are going to fall. And um, I, don't, I don't think it's about the fast which is what makes it really interesting. I, I know that there's definitely some interactions between juggling and group theory. Um, it's not something I've looked into a whole lot. Um, and I don't know exactly the ways that group theory is applied to juggling, but it definitely is applied. There's a lot of modular arithmetic going on in site swaps. Um, and I know I've heard of like uh, people have defined these things called like prime juggling patterns, uh, stuff like that. So th there's definitely a lot of room to incorporate group theory into juggling, but I don't know in what capacity that's really been done. Yeah, yeah, I haven't thought of that. Um, like you, you could look for classes of juggling patterns where they look the same in a mirror or they're the same that you play backwards. Um, right off the bat, I, I can tell you that most struggling patterns don't look the same in a mirror or most struggling patterns don't look the same played backwards. For instance, this is the cascade. This is the reverse cascade. It's, this is what it looks like if you play the regular juggling pattern in reverse. Or this pattern I was showing you before is Mills Mess. Here's, uh, this is reverse Mills Mess. And so it's a little bit different. And so they're, they're really interesting ideas. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of ways to extend the theory of juggling to make room for group theory to help come up with new juggling patterns or theories that relate to patterns. Yeah. Like how, in how, particle how? physics, there's also charge conjugation symmetry. So I don't, I don't, that's like the yellow ball turning into a red ball or something. I don't know. Oh, it's actually really interesting. Um, I have seen, I, I don't remember enough about this to do it justice, but like anti-matter site swap almost. So like when two, like you, you do a squeeze catch or something like this and then when two objects, maybe one has a positive digit and the other has a negative digit. This is a negative three and this is a three. When they come into contact, the balls annihilate. And the way that that was performed was they're glow balls. And when they come into contact, the, the lights and the balls go off. Um, so yeah, there's a lot okay. of interesting connections. Yeah. I don't know if I described the theory accurately when I said one was a three and one was a negative three, but it, it's something like that. Yeah, so the simulation doesn't have any knowledge about the noise. It was a, a very naive simulation. And we were basically just looking what combinations of angle and velocity noises does juggling work. But there's a lot of work to be done in improving the, uh, how realistic the simulation can be. But I myself, when I juggle, I certainly notice when there's a mistake. Um, oftentimes, it'll almost ruin everything. Just because I'm able to catch a ball that was thrown badly does not mean anything about if I'm gonna be able to make good throws after making that save. Because so much about juggling is maintaining a consistent rhythm. Um, and honestly, just even changing the amplitude of the oscillations of your hands, it can really throw off that rhythm. And so a lot of times making a save from a bad throw is not what's hard, but making good throws after you make that save is what's even harder. So yeah, incorporating that into the simulation would definitely be good. Presumably different jugglers are, are differently talented. So. So, I mean, the answers may depend on the nature of the noise, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. What? You were just um, sort there, of putting in that... some generic noise, but it may be that juggler A is so much better that the answer is different. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's people that could like, I don't know if the ball's there, they can reach up here and grab it and they keep juggling seven balls down here. It's possible. Um, and so, yeah, we could definitely have different both levels of proficiency in and the catch, simulation. Right, yeah. So there's an, an infinite complexity to your simulations, I think, if you... Yeah, yeah, it can get very complicated. <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions? You were suggesting teaching people to juggle, but maybe, maybe do, I mean, is there a video to point to maybe? I don't, I don't wanna keep you all um, There's a lot of videos uh, you, you could watch online to learn how to juggle. 
um, I would look up maybe Taylor Tries uh, Three Ball Juggling Tutorial if you want to learn. Um, right. okay. There's a bunch of tutorials out there. Uh, you, you could find any number of them. This is one that I think is, is very good. It's very well done. Yeah. yeah, I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>